Please subscribe to this channel for more videos related to Catholic Christian teaching. In the previous session, we learned the meaning of the name Jesus Christ, which entails both the theological implication and the mission of Jesus. We also spent some time discovering the significance of the terms Son of God and Lord given to Jesus during the course of his life on earth. In this episode, we will get to understand the phrase he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit from the Creed. To the question why did the Word become flesh? With the Nicene Creed, we answered by confessing, For us men and for our salvation, He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. In another word, the Word became flesh for us in order to save us by reconciling us with God, who loved us and sent His Son to be the expiation for our sins. The Father has sent His Son as the Savior of the world, and He was revealed to take away sins. The Word became flesh so that we might know God's love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. The Word became flesh to be our model of holiness. On the mountain of the Transfiguration, the Father commands, Listen to Him. Jesus is the model for the Beatitudes and the norm of the new law. Love one another as I have loved you. This love implies an effective offering of oneself after his example. The Word became flesh to make us partakers of the divine nature. For the Son of God became man so that we might become God. The only begotten Son of God, wanting to make us sharers in His divinity, assumed our nature so that He made man, might make men gods. The Church calls incarnation as the fact that the Son of God assumed a human nature in order to accomplish our salvation. Belief in the true incarnation of the Son of God is the distinctive sign of Christian faith. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come to the flesh is of God. The unique and altogether singular event of the incarnation of the Son of God does not mean that Jesus Christ is part God and part man, nor does it imply that He is the result of a confused mixture of the divine and the human. He became truly man while remaining truly God. Jesus Christ is true God and true man. During the early centuries, the Church has to defend and clarify this truth of faith against the heresies that falsified it. Because human nature was assumed, not absorbed, in the mysterious union of the Incarnation, the Church was led to confess 
the full reality of Christ's human soul, with its operations of intellect and will, and of his human body. In parallel fashion, the Church had to recall that Christ's human nature belongs as his own to the divine person of the Son of God who assumed it. Everything that Christ is and does in this nature derives from one of the Trinity. The Son of God therefore communicates to his humanity his own personal mode of existence in the Trinity. In his souls as in his body, Christ thus expresses humanly the divine ways of the Trinity. The Son of God worked with human hands, he thought with human mind, he acted with a human will, and with a human heart he loved. Born of the Virgin Mary, he has truly been made one of us, like to us in all things except sin. The Church confesses that the Eternal Son also assumed a rational human soul. This human soul that the Son of God assumed is endowed with a true human knowledge. As such, this knowledge could not in itself be unlimited. It was exercised in the historical conditions of his existence in space and time. This is why the Son of God could, when he became man, increase in wisdom and in stature, and in favor with God and man, and would even have to inquire for himself about what one in the human condition can learn only from experience. But at the same time, this truly human knowledge of God's Son expressed the divine life of His person, the human nature of God's Son, not by itself, but by its union with the Word, knew and showed forth in itself everything that pertains to God. Such is, first of all, the case with the intimate and immediate knowledge that the Son of God made man has of his Father. The Son in his human knowledge also showed the divine penetration he had into the secret thoughts of human hearts. By its union to the divine wisdom in the person of the Word incarnate, Christ enjoyed in his human knowledge the fullness of understanding of the eternal plans he had come to reveal. What he admitted to not knowing in this area, he elsewhere declared himself not sent to reveal. At the Sixth Ecumenical Council, Constantinople III in 681, the Church confessed that Christ possesses two wills and two natural operations, divine and human. They are not opposed to each other, but cooperate in such a way that the Word made flesh, willed humanly in obedience to His Father, all that He had decided divinely with the Father and the Holy Spirit for our salvation. At the same time, the Church has always acknowledged that in the body of Jesus we see our God made visible and so are caught up in love of the God we cannot see. The individual characteristics of Christ's body express the divine person of God's Son. He has made the features of his human body his own to the point that they can be venerated when portrayed in a holy image. For the believer who venerates the icon, 
is venerating in it the person of the one depicted. Please go to YouTube Retirement Mentality channel for your favorite playlists on the Catholic Christian teachings and other uplifting materials.